Welcome to this Bickle International Seminar, international event on um, COVID-19 vaccine compensation schemes. Great pleasure to be running this at Bickle, along with our partners, uh, global partners around the world, the Institut de droit comparé, University de Paris 2, the O'Neill Institute for National and Global Health Law at Georgetown University, the University of Western Australia Law School and Obligations Lab Asia at the Chinese University of Hong Kong. Um, compensation schemes for these uh, COVID-19 vaccines is an important and very topical theme, obviously. Uh, this conference will be primarily a lawyer's view, a legal analysis of the, um, of, of the schemes, um, and which are obviously a very important part of ensuring acceptability of the important uh, vaccine, vaccine rollout, as well as a um, providing an equitable response to a small percentage of those who are infected by um, adverse reactions. I know that some of those affected in their families have joined us today and I recognise this is obviously a very difficult time for them and their loved ones and um, what we're trying to do today is an academic endeavour to try and learn from international experience in this area uh, in order to improve on the, the, the remedies at a national level uh, and to um, in, uh, 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 in the search for um, remedies, effective remedies um, for the, the, those effects. There should be plenty of time for questions and comments, so please feel free to use those attending, feel free to use the Q&A function, which you find at the bottom of the screen. Um, you can post questions at any moment. We will try and there will be sort of allotted times during the conference to respond to those questions, but feel free to pose them as, as, as we're going along uh, and we will endeavour to, to react to those. The, the way in which this conference is organised in two, two um, sections really, the first part of the conference will be looking at uh, at a national level, country level uh, and a jurisdiction level as well because we're looking at the COVAX scheme as well um, and we'll be focusing on the national reaction, the, the individual schemes as it were, as to how they operate, what the conditions are, etc., uh, and that'll give us, I think, a good tour d'horizon about what's going on, as well as the newly established schemes that um, a number of our um, presenters will, um, will be telling us about. So there's a lot of things happening in this space, and so it'll be very good to have a have an update. In a second section, what we're going to try and do is, having undertaken that tour d'horizon. What we're going to try and do then is delve into some of the specific cross-cutting themes um, and we've grouped those together. They'll be led by four of our presenters I'll introduce in, in, in a minute uh, and we'll be looking at issues of eligibility, we're looking at causation and quantum, we'll be focusing also on the important issue about process and accessibility to the schemes and then looking at how these schemes sit within the broader systemic um, environment in terms of the, the overall system of justice and the funding issues, etc. So that'll be the second part of the of the seminar. So without further ado, let's start with the, 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 the first part that is looking at the individual schemes. It's a great pleasure for us to start with um, an analysis of the COVAX No Fault Compensation Programme. We have Alex Forrest and Hélène Mazur and Raphael Larota, who are going to who will be very, very closely involved in, in devising this scheme. So it's a, a great privilege for how guys to have the three of them with us today. And let's take out time to, to, to tell us about this very this trailblazing pioneering scheme. Alex, Alex Forrest is head of life science, um, life sciences at Chubb um, Insurance. He manages a portfolio of life science companies everywhere outside of North America, and he's been uh, very closely involved in setting up the scheme. We have also Anne-Hélène Mazur, as I said, who's a principal legal officer at the um, WHO and head of corporate and contractual matters in the legal office of the um, World Health Organization. 
and she has led on the devising the COVAX no fault compensation program. Rafael Larota is insurance risk management officer. Again, he's been very closely active member of the COVAX um, task force uh, with, a, and he's experienced in, in insurance matters. And he'll be able to tell us a bit about that, the insurance link to that as well, what's an important facet of the scheme. So thanks very much to those and I'll hand over initially to, to Alex uh, for us and then we'll have questions afterwards if you want to pose questions. So over to you, Alex. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Duncan, for that introduction. And uh, yeah, we have Raphael and Anne who were uh, certainly the driving force at, at the WHO uh, behind putting the, the very important COVAX no fault compensation program um, together. So um, as you can imagine, um, when individual countries um, try and put together compensation programs, uh, it takes considerable resources uh, and different infrastructure to form those and run, which is probably why in, in the last 40, 50 years or, or however long since the first one, we haven't seen huge numbers of VICVs put in place. And, and that I think is in the context of a, a single country, and a single legal con uh, context and, and a legal dynamic. Um, so, you know, we know that these things are complex uh, and they're certainly not ubiquitous uh, across the globe. Um, and then we were, uh, had to come across the proposition of, um, you know, the pandemic uh, scenario and trying to look at uh, numerous economies and territories. Um, and all of those really lacked any kind of VICP uh, infrastructure um, for the, in the first place. And uh, alongside that, we've got um, the nature of the pandemic being a very emergent risk, uh, emerging vaccines and novel technology, uh, and manufacturers that were um, understandably, given how the, the speed with which they were developed, um, reticent to take on the liabilities. And so we had to find a way in which we could bridge the lack of local infrastructure in those territories um, and across multiple territories with um, you know finding a way to, to protect those manufacturers and their potential liability and, and, and that's what we were tasked to do um, and you know that was the important lesson from prior pandemics um, was to find an avenue to make that equitable access uh, happen for vaccines for those economies because you know what what we saw before in prior pandemics 2009 and, and earlier was that uh, you know ultimately other territories got over the line and found a way whereas these emerging economies uh, never did and I think that probably leads me on to scope um, you know what, what was the scope of what we were trying to achieve and I think that's an important uh, point to note from the outset um, you know the program was put together in pretty good pretty quick order I think when you compare it to maybe uh, legislation that went through on in, on national VICPs that take years to develop um, and I, I'm sure we will learn through that process and already have learned and will continue to learn what works and what what doesn't through the process but what it isn't is a long-term vaccine plan um, it was very clear that the um, the remit of what we were trying to achieve was to cover the initial urgent uh, need to protect um, those most in need uh, and really through the peak of the pandemic uh, in those territories that needed the most support, you know, those, uh, those poorer economies uh, and what we classed as the AMC 92. So it, it, it wasn't ever intended as a long-term solution to, to vaccine delivery in those regions um, or as a mechanism for, for other uh, more affluent countries that, that really have both the resources um, and the mechanisms to really um, do their own thing and, and need to put their own house in, in order. So, um, and maybe we touch on that later, but, but that very clearly the scope was for the here and now uh, and to solve that short-term issue about how do we get that equitable access to vaccines and join those two, two things together. So then, uh, you know, back in September it was, uh, it was, you know, what do we need to do to put the program together and how do we do it? Uh, and, and the WHO reviewed uh, what the immediate needs were. Um, they looked at some of the, the history of other VICP programs um, built upon you know, other available learnings. But I think very clearly it was trying to find uh, a process that, um, and there was an ethos about it, which was to be fast, fair, robust, and, and transparent. Uh, and uh, as we came into that process, it was important that we also allied with those, with those concepts. Um, now, 
clearly those are just words that, that need more around them. And so there was much decision making around what, what does fast actually mean and, and what does fair actually mean. And, and that will be the context for the next hour and three quarters, I'm sure. Um, but, you know, we, we worked our way through that uh, to try and build the infrastructure that was needed to, in, uh, to execute as claims came in. Uh, in a fast and fair, uh, fair way. And then also uh, from my side, on the underwriting side, I had to figure out the financial implications of, of what we could foresee could happen. So, uh, and everything that went through that. Uh, and that obviously was key to, to COVAX and, and the conveners of COVAX as well to understand the financial potential implications of the scheme uh, and understanding um, from it from their perspective. So, you know, overall, it took about, um, you know, close to six months to work through. Um, some stuff we, we did pretty quickly and some stuff took a bit longer. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, a variety of different implications of those discussions. But, you know, the, the key things to work through that we went through, which will be no surprise, were the scope of cover. Um, so the type of injury that we wanted to cover and what we thought actually probably doesn't need to be covered. Um, sources of injury, whether it was just the vaccine itself or vaccination process that could cause injury, etc. Um, you know, the level of cover as well. So, so what, what would we construe as fair and, and how do we make that fair across 92 different com uh, countries and, or economies uh, as well? So what level of compensation? Uh, and then potentially some additional benefits as well. Uh, you know, is there something else that we need to think about in the claim process in terms of how these people have been uh, harmed or injured and can offer something else outside, outside of that. Um, and then uh, the third key was actually, you know, how, how is injury going to be assessed? And I think, you know, from the existing VICPs, there was, you know, a difficulty in, in trying to get um, clarity of sight on that. And, and we had to figure out what was best for our program uh, in terms of that assessment and, and, and determining you know, causality and the assessment of injury in its its own right. So, you know, that was a, a considerable um, aspect for us to work through. And, and there were many, many, many more matters, but clearly they were the three principles that we we had to um, the core the core things that we needed to work through to get a functioning program uh, over the line. Um, I think from an underwriting perspective, uh, a fascinating risk, something that uh, I'll I'll never see again in my underwriting career. I think um, even if there is another pandemic. You know, a very difficult risk from an underwriting perspective. Um, clearly, a very novel risk where um, there is some clear natural uh, residual risk. You know, all vaccines uh, do create injuries. That is not to say that vaccines don't work or are bad, but there is a natural residual risk to them. Uh, and you know, we had to try and calibrate and figure out what that natural uh, risk would be, and then figure out some some additional risks should should there be uh, issues. Uh, more excessive issues with them. So, um, you know, we are used to underwriting novel products. That's what we do day in, day out through the clinical trials that we ensure. But, uh, but I think when we're looking at something of this scale and the speed of the development uh, and just the, the lack of lack of data there, it was, it was a challenge for us to um, truly get our head around. Um, you know, we, we did use data from uh, existing vaccine injury where we could find it. Uh, we made many assumptions and we had to look at not just the kind of injury aspect of it, but also some societal things like the, the likelihood of claims, etc. So there were plenty of assumptions that went into the model and I, I have a new found respect maybe for some, some of these uh, pandemic modelers when we're looking at cases because having to build a model myself, it, it was not easy and you could see how easily it could turn left or right. So only time will tell. Um, in terms of our underwriting on on the program, but you know it was it was a pleasure to try and get something an important program uh, into a position where we can we can get that vaccine equity um, to those to those territories and, and, and economies. Um, the operation of the scheme, um, I think, key to the whole scheme was was having a partner that can actually deliver on the ground. So in the same way that Covax use partners to deliver the vaccines in, in UNICEF and other partners. Um, you know, it's not within the mandate of, of uh, the WHO or any of the other COVAX conveners to manage a compensation program and, and you know, would rather not. Um, they needed to find an experienced um, independent claims administrator, administrator um, who ultimately has the, the infrastructure and the network to be able to execute on the plan and the protocol. So evaluate individual claims, do that in a consistent way. Um, 
you know, set up the, the infrastructure and, and the technology to be able to submit um, applications uh, and also make the payments, which is uh, actually not, not to be underestimated, uh, moving money around the world in some of these territories. So, um, you know, we, we had, uh, as part of Chubb, we had that, um, that administrator within our organization that could go and execute on that. Um, and it was, it was um, a pleasure to bring them into the, into the organization as well. Um, and then, you know, ultimately after all of those discussions, you know, what was the result? We, we got a common program that applies across all 92 economies um, that we could, we could apply. Um, it was, uh, we feel a consistent approach across those. There was fairness in the way that all territories uh, and economies were handled uh, in a similar way. Um, but there was some level of um, uh, equitable nature of those economies that was taken into account as well. So I think we got the balance right there. Um, and ultimately, it's a program now that it is in place joins those two things. The manufacturers are happy that there is, uh, you know, protection in terms of, of, of them and their liabilities. Um, and, uh, you know, we've ultimately found an infrastructure for the, the countries and the economies themselves to protect their, their, own, uh, their own people. Uh, and so we've managed to join those two things and al allow the flow of vaccines into those economies, uh, which, is, which is great. And... Uh, you know, as I said, we're, we're learning as we're going and it's still early days, but I think we've, we've got a program that strikes the balance between speed, fairness and transparency. And I think there is a balance there. Uh, you can move too quick on these things and you can move too slow. And we will continue to learn as we handle more and more claims uh, and we will continue to review on a constant feedback. Um, uh, and, and, you know, we'll, we'll see more and more as we come through, especially as we're dealing with remote community communities uh, which is something that I think the existing VICPs, uh, you know, don't have to deal with. They haven't uh, got that same dynamic. So, you know, we are treading some new ground there. Uh, and as I said, you know, there is a, a process with which we will feedback and understand where we're going wrong or, or hopefully uh, going right the whole time. Um, yeah. Thanks so much, Alex, for that. Um, really interesting. Um, I wanted to bring into discussion Anne and Raphael have been working with Alex to put together the, the scheme. And did you want to say a word maybe about from your side, having set it up? I mean, it's a very ambitious scheme. It was done at, you know, very quickly. Um, and they've had some experience in these sort of things in the past, but it's a, a, a pretty incredible achievement to have done that. Um, so can I hand over to you? Maybe you just want to say a word? Sure, thank you very much. Um, I, I thought it may perhaps be uh, a good idea to give a little bit of the history also. Uh, uh, COVAX uh, uh, includes, as you may know, WHO, Gavi and CEPI. And uh, a task force was set up uh, uh, within COVAX to deal with the difficult question of indemnification and liability and how to resolve this issue uh, 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 for uh, countries that receive vaccines through COVAX. And uh, as part of that, uh, the task force focused its efforts uh, on three work streams. One was uh, indemnification, another was no-fault compensation, and the third one was uh, consultations. And, um, um, WHO, also because of its previous involvement in an unlicensed vaccine insurance program, uh, uh, um, led on the dis establishment on the COVAX, of the COVAX no fault compensation program. And this followed extensive consultations uh, uh, with industry, pharmaceutical industry, and uh, with countries. And out of that, uh, uh, the COVAX no fault compensation program was was born. Uh, uh, it it its scope is limited to the 92 AMC eligible economies, which are 92 low and middle income countries. And for and the reason for us having decided to limit the scope of the program to these countries is that these are typically the countries that lack the resources. Uh, uh, to indemnify manufacturers. Uh, we also considered uh, that we wanted very much to uh, focus on the acute phase of the pandemic. And therefore it's a time limited arrangement uh, uh, for vaccines that are distributed through COVAX 
uh, until up and until uh, 30 June 2022. Uh, um, remains to be seen uh, uh, whether continued justification will apply for its extension, but it's too early days to tell that right now. Uh, uh, so it's a time limited arrangement, as I said. Uh, and uh, we also decided to have a, on the one hand, a limited scope of coverage per vaccines, which was 24 months from the date a vaccine is first put into circulation in any country, because it was felt that after 24 months, sufficient data should in principle be uh, uh, available uh, uh, um, regarding the safety profile of the vaccine and for a manufacturer to make its own arrangements. Secondly, we wanted to give individuals a very long reporting time to submit applications uh, because A, of course, it takes time to, uh, um, uh, for, for individuals to learn about the program, although we are advertising this very much in countries. Uh, uh, but also it may take time for uh, 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 serious adverse events to become apparent and, uh, uh, and then to gather all the supporting evidence that's needed to be submitted to the program. Uh, uh, and therefore, for as long as a vaccine is administered within these 24 months I mentioned earlier, individuals have an additional period of additional on top of the 24 months of 36 months uh, uh, to submit an application. So that's very long. Uh, um, just briefly, finally, we decided to limit ourselves to permanent impairment and death and not to include temporary disabilities. Uh, and uh, in respect of permanent impairment, we decided to include all levels of impairment. So not only the more major impairments. I'll stop perhaps here. Uh, uh, I'm sure there'll be many questions. Uh, Thanks, uh, so uh, I'll, in, yes. Maybe we could bring in Raphael. I know Raphael, you, um, the insurance angle is, was, was very important as we heard a minute ago from, from Alex. Maybe you could just say a word about that in your previous experiences there, which may not be that, that were known to those to attendees. Um, if you say a word about that, that'd be interesting. Anne. Yes, uh, thank you, Duncan. Um, as Anne has said, uh, we had a, a long uh, collaboration pr uh, process with many actors uh, to get to, to where we are today. And one of these actors that we consulted with were people that have had a, a fairly large experience in setting up uh, compensation programs of a, of a broad scale. Uh, and um, it was interesting that from the start, these people uh, uh, always expressed that uh, uh, the likelihood of being able to get any form of insurance support was, uh, was highly improbable. There was a high, high skepticism based on the experience that they have had. Uh, I personally thought that we were uh, always uh, uh, be able to get some insurance support. support. However, we, we made the decision from the early start that we would have a no-fall compensation mechanism one way or the other with or without insurance. So, so we, we were gonna proceed one, one way or the other. And uh, this, this program, uh, a, 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 the capital for the program is financed uh, by a donor funded per dose levy on the vaccines that are delivered through COVAX to the AMC eligible economies until 30 June, 2022. So, uh, and we know uh, what is the expected level of distribution. And obviously, against that dose, we had a capital that we had to work with uh, originally. And, and based on, on our studies and of uh, other VICPs around the world, we, we made an, an initial projection uh, of, of the frequency of claims. And, uh, and we know what is the level of, 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 of benefit that we will end up paying on a per claim basis. So we, we believe that um, uh, our, our, our rough estimate originally indicated that the capital we had was sufficient to, to, to pay for what we think are projected claims, but a projection is a projection, you know, and this, and this is really unprecedented. So we always thought that we needed insurance support 
for two reasons. One, because we believe that participation of insurance gives this whole process high credibility. Insurers have a lot to say, uh, uh, like the case of Alex and, 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 uh, and, and, and his colleagues who have contributed largely uh, for us to, to come to where, where we are right now. But second, we, we always have to believe or understand that uh, if the projection goes wrong, we're going to run out of funds. And we, the last thing we want to have is, is have to suspend a, a, a process until we get more money and, and get things difficult. So, so we, we uh, uh, insisted uh, uh, always working with Alex and uh, our broker and, and other players to get this insurance support. And, and, and we did get it. Uh, and so we have ended up with a robust, a real robust program that we believe uh, uh, has ample ability to uh, uh, um, uh, respond to claims uh, beyond the projections because that, that could very well be. But it was a very, very interesting uh, uh, exercise. We have ended up with, with uh, Chubb as the lead and, and a total of 10 in insurers around the world. Um, we have probably uh, uh, absorbed all the capacity there is for these kind of programs around the world, uh, but uh, uh, so be it. And we, we're very proud that, that, that this, this came to to, to this uh, fruition and to this uh, collaborative effort with, with a very, very uh, uh, good program uh, around the world. Thanks, Raphael. Um, really interesting um, what you said about the funding model, the insurance backdrop, et cetera. That's uh, interesting, more probably widely relevant as well, some of the discussions. And we have to move on now, but I think I, I, I foresee that probably have questions later on as well, so do hang on. Um, it's great to, to hear from you. We're going to move now on um, to Sam Luby, Professor Sam Luby, who's going to tell us, I'd like to have Sam with us. He's been conducting some, he's worked on this area for a long period of time, and he's been working away on monitoring the new systems that have been um, developed over the last 18 months or so. Um, and so it would be really interesting to hear from Sam. He's a senior scholar, visiting professor at the O'Neill Institute for National and Global Health Law at Georgetown, which is a, a partner or co-organizer in this, this event. And he leads a center for transformational health law there, is an international expert on uh, these compensation schemes. So Sam, can I hand over to you to talk about the newly created scheme? I think you're gonna say a word about stateside as well, about the US system as well. Yeah, absolutely. And I want to start by sort of thanking Duncan and, and Bickle for um, convening this important meeting. Uh, there's a lot of um, information uh, out there about no fault compensation schemes, a lot of confusion um, about them. Um, and one of the roles uh, that uh, we wanted to play at the Anil Institute was being a resource um, for the AMC 92 countries as well. Um, the other note I just want to mention preliminarily is to sort of congratulate Raphael and Anne and Alex on what is an extraordinary achievement um, in creating a, a global infrastructure for uh, vaccine injury claims. Um, but as they mentioned, uh, co the, the COVAX compensation scheme is limited. Um, so it was never COVAX's aim um, to provide immunizations for more than 20% of a given population, um, although that may change in the future. Um, and, and the scheme itself um, has internal limitations that Alex and, and Raphael uh, and Anne mentioned. Um, at the O'Neill Institute, we're about a 40-person strong uh, research institution located within Georgetown, um, and we regularly receive requests for assistance um, from all over the world, uh, not just related to no fault uh, vaccine injury compensation, but to other areas of health law. And our intent was to was to research countries that had uh, put in place no fault compensation systems, anticipating the gap between what COVAX could provide uh, and uh, what uh, was ultimately going to be covered for, to the extent of the community. Uh, we identified uh, 13 jurisdictions where those no fault compensation systems have been established. Unlike previous ethics, they've been established um, at least 50%, maybe a little bit more in low or middle income countries. Um, and so, uh, so Brazil, uh, Colombia, the Czech Republic, 
Guatemala, Honduras, Peru, um, uh, Poland, uh, Singapore, Tunisia, South Africa. Um, and the features of those systems are a little bit different than their predecessors as well. Um, so they are almost entirely funded by commitments to public revenues. Um, the one exception is Peru, which has specifically authorized the use of a debt instrument um, to cover the cost of the compensation schemes. Um, they are also sort of consistent with what has been mentioned before. Um, they're, they don't have a lot of specifics as to the administrative infrastructure. Um, so uh, 11 of the systems are committed to the ministries of health um, without a great deal more specification. Um, they rely on committees, um, typically five to seven person committees um, who will meet, review the evidence and determine whether or not compensation uh, should be uh, should be paid. Um, so they are a little bit different, um, but it shows that this is an important component of public health preparedness uh, and response. Um, I wanted to mention a little bit about the United States, um, which Duncan has, has asked me to address. Uh, so uh, in the United States, as many of you know, there are actually two systems. Um, so there is a system for routine immunizations recommended for children pregnant women, um, and in some cases, adults, for example, influenza. And then from 2005, we have something separate called the Countermeasure of Injury Compensation Program. Um, and that is specifically for public health emergencies. Um, so there has to be a declaration by our Secretary of Health and Human Services, effectively our Minister of Health, um, as to what those covered countermeasures are. Um, that latter system is, is far more limited in terms of eligibility and in terms of compensation that's available. Um, so the system for routine immunizations um, essentially uses a judicial process and claimants are entitled to the damages they can prove with evidence. Uh, the latter program for public health emergencies um, is limited to a table um, and they are limited to a single year in which to file. Um, the routine immunization program is funded through a 75 cent per dose levy on manufacturers. The emergency system is funded only if Congress, our legislature, decides to fund it. Um, and even for uh, COVID-19 vaccines, um, sort of there are statements by the Secretary of Health and Human Services that those monies have been dedicated. But when you actually read the statutory language adopted by Congress, it isn't clear that it has been. Um, in addition, sort of the payments for injury, especially death, are, are quite low um, by comparison. So the max, uh, the maximum is around three hundred fifty thousand U.S. dollars um, should a death follow an immunization. Um, so uh, you know, there's there's a great deal more that could be said about the thirteen uh, systems that we've identified, including the fact that we have followed robust conversations in some jurisdictions like Ireland, like Kenya, as it turns out over the course of this conference and one of the values I think it brings um, is that we have been following conversations in Australia and Hong Kong. Um, evidently those countries have, have confirmed um, their schemes. Um, so Professor Ritz uh, Professor Ritzen, um, can address those, um, those schemes respectively. But there is always more to be learned, um, but we think that there are important lessons for low and middle income countries that want to establish uh, these kinds of schemes. So I'll leave it there and, and save the rest of the q Thanks very much, Sam. That was really interesting what you said. Just a quick question about the, the sort of new schemes. In terms of accessibility, are, are these online? Are they, you know, because it's quite a range of countries you're discussing, you know, referring to there um, in, in, in different regions, et cetera, some of which populations will, will have readily access to online or et cetera, others less so, similar to, to what we heard from, from Am Alex and Raphael in terms of you know, accessibility uh, challenges, etc. Is there a, is there anything you're able to say about that in you know the efforts that have been undertaken to make sure these schemes are open to those generally, including people who don't necessarily have access to immediate access to online facilities, computers, etc. Yeah, and no, very few of the laws um, provide for that level of detail. Um, and some of the, the new laws are quite constrained. So for example, Honduras limits the claims period um, for its population to 60 days, um, just 
just quite a narrow window, but there aren't details other than mandates within the statutes to issue those kinds of specifying um, application details later. Um, but it, what I will say is a general character of the new systems, which I think is advantageous, is that there isn't a requirement um, or, or even a necessity for legal counsel, um, which, for example, in, in the United States under its routine systems is more or less a necessity. Um, so to the extent that's a barrier, it, it hasn't surfaced. Um, but as to online accessibility, there's very few details. Thanks. Um, interesting to see how it's all implemented. Obviously, a lot of the the the, the devil's going to be in the detail and the operational actual kind of protocols as well. So it'd be interesting to follow that research. And I imagine you and your institute will be looking at that to be uh, interesting to revisit that at a later stage and see how it works out in practice. Thanks very much, Sam, for that. Um, now let's switch to um, the specific individual countries. I think Grind, Professor Grind, I was going to say a word about the UK. Grind is uh, probably well known to you all. He's the Executive Dean of the College of Business Policy and Law at the National University of Iron Galway and Visiting Professor of Commercial Law uh, in, in Manchester, great authority on product liabilities, written a lot on this area. Uh, including vaccines as well, and we'll say a word about the UK, maybe we'll say a word about Ireland. I just heard Sam mentioning an Ireland. So <laughs> your new location there, Guy, you can you can do a sort of two two country comparison all in yeah. five minutes. <laughs> well, yeah, I hope that'll be less than five minutes because I think our scheme is quite a, a simple one in the UK. Um, it was introduced in 1979 as a temporary measure, and it depends on. The vaccine being listed in a, in a prescribed list of vaccines that are potentially uh, liable to give rise to compensation and the COVID vaccine has been added to that list and it gives you uh, a lump sum of £120,000 and it's been raised over the years to £120,000 but um, that um, it, it, it's quite interesting that it it, that £120,000 is, it, is described as a payment made on account of damages. So it was sort of assumed that because it was an interim measure and might have been reviewed again later on, that at that time there was at least uh, an understanding that people would still be going into the civil justice system. So in effect, it becomes a sort of quasi-subsidy to the manufacturer. And I think that's that sort of temporary nature of it uh, hasn't really been uh, reconsidered over the years. Um, you need to have a severe disability of, of a, a 60% on the uh, scale, and that's a difficulty for some people to prove. Uh, proving causation is often problematic in the cases, and I saw a quite startling figure that only 6% of cases are being successful, which I think is, is quite telling. And um, one of the famous cases here of Love Day and Renton, when somebody was successful, they went forward to litigate and effectively use that 120,000 or whatever the amount was at the time to fund the litigation uh, and weren't able to prove causation. So it does show how causation can be a big hurdle, both in the courts and in the tribunal system. There was a quite important case in the Court of Appeal um, uh, based around whether a seven-year-old boy with narcolepsy had 6% um, disability. The government argued you should judge that against his position age seven. The Court of Appeal eventually said no, it was 6% uh, based on his the impact of the injury on his lifetime. And so he was covered by the compensation scheme. That was quite an important case. Um, as you say, Ireland is, uh, I've been just doing a little bit of reading on the internet about this, uh, moving its way towards proposing um, uh, a no-fault compensation scheme, which uh, I understand they say will be ex gratia. Um, one thing I note about Ireland is they're very much into the human rights. And I think there's a fear that if it was a case that was um, usurping the right to go to courts anyway, um, that might fall foul of human rights. So I need to look into that a bit more. It may also be a question, does a, does a statutory scheme that's not ex gratia have to be excluding your rights because the UK system allows you to continue those rights anyway and they, they go hand in hand so maybe there's some interesting work to work on the Irish scheme there and so really uh, interesting to hear all of this I was actually um, trying to do some calculations and maybe I've got the Garvey scheme wrong 
but in my calculations, it's probably about three times more generous than the UK scheme. So I don't know if that's right or not, but um, <laughs> if anyone's better at maths or understanding the Garvey scheme, I assume the GDP per capita of about 30,000 in the UK, um, and I think it's multiplied of 12 if you've got a 60% incapacity. So that's 360,000 plus uh, hospitalization rights under the Garvey scheme. So uh, that's perhaps a, you know, an interesting benchmark to put back to national governments if my maths is right, which it often isn't. So um, I'll do that. I also think there's a very interesting debate, and this is my last sentence, Duncan, about what is the impact of compensation schemes on the public? Uh, does it, as I've sort of argued, increase their confidence because it says take the vaccine and we'll stand behind it. We, we were confident it's it's um, it's safe um, and we're, we're willing to put our money where our mouth is by having a compensation scheme to show that. Or does it actually, um, well, do people even think about that when they're making the decision to take the vaccine or not? Uh, or does it put a, a fear into people's minds that, you know, if there's a compensation scheme, there must be a risk there, which I'm exposing myself to. So I think the psychology of whether these schemes uh, will help to promote the, um, the uptake of the vaccine is interesting. I'm on the side that anyway, you know, the governments will get around to compensating these people one way or another, uh, and it's better to do it up front and be clear about it. But I think there's a, a few interesting debates there about how these schemes work in the big picture, probably the most important challenge of our generation to get the world protected against uh, this uh, terrible disease. And uh, I only applaud the, the wonderful work that people are doing in the Garvey Institute uh, and also um, you know, in, in all these countries around the world trying to get this right. Thank you. Thanks, Gawain. When you mentioned causation, I saw Richard Goldberg's eyebrows move there. Um, we'll be hearing- well, he understands all that, I don't. <laughs> we'll be hearing from Richard just a little bit later on, but clearly that, I mean, I think the point you made there about the UK scheme, the, the causal aspect, I'm sure Richard will pick up on that. Very, very important, quite challenging. Interesting also the comparing the levels of, of quantum, um, what you said there in relation to GDP. And again, when we're thinking about what Sam, the points Sam's were just making and earlier on about the US scheme, even the, you know, the emergency scheme, uh, 350,000 US dollars, obviously much more generous than the UK scheme. So let's show you that the UK scheme is, 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 is somewhat out of step um, if, um, uh, in relation to those other um, schemes. And in aura, I think, you, did you want to say a word about, about, about I thought I saw your hand, Ray, when Grant's point about whether the, the existence of the scheme reinforces acceptability of the vaccine or does it, actually do something else does it make you know one concerned about you, you know the, the existence of it? i think to some extent we all now know um uh, about the, the the risks out there but did you want to say a word on that point uh, okay uh yes i was interested about the psychological effect of the compensation fund moreover i'm interested about the systematic effect of the compensation fund for instance in italy we do have this kind of public compensation scheme since 1992 uh, in favor of the victims of um, compulsory vaccines and also of uh, vaccines which are um, strongly recommended by government. Uh, this mechanism does not preclude the victim uh, to file a lawsuit eventually against the manufacturer under the product liability directive or under the fault law, uh, general tort law um, provisions. However, what we see in Italy is that there's no one case brought against the manufacturer applying the product liability directive. So what it seems very interesting to me is the fact that the existence of this instrument uh, somehow has the effect to exempt de facto the manufacturer from any liability. The compensation scheme is uh, in Italy uh, fully uh, funded by the public money. So there's no contribution from the producers. And uh, um, what else can I say? Uh, it uh, the function to give an indemnity. So it doesn't aim at the full compensation of the losses. It's just mm -hmm. a, a 
kind of subsidy given for solidarity reasons to the victims. Uh, the underlying idea is that because the vaccination is something which is beneficial for the entire community, uh, so the entire community benefits from the vaccination of the individual. If the individual uh, get an injury because of the vaccines, then the community has the duty to give something back to compensate the, the, the injury for some sort of solidarity reasons. Therefore, it's not a full compensation of the, of the losses. It's something else, but however, it's some de facto, as I said, exempt, exclude, the lawsuit against the manufacturer under the part of liability directive, but I hope we will discuss more yeah. in detail in the second part of our of our meeting this exactly. uh, systematic effect. Exactly, you, you raised some really important points about the about the relationship with litigation about the issue of funding, Illinois, which we will pick up on in detail. And I've seen there is a question also about the. The statistics, the data in relation to side effects at the moment, well, which we'll pick up a bit later on. But I want to now move to um, Canada. We've got Jennifer uh, Keelan, who has uh, joined us from Toronto. Great to have Jennifer with us as well. Um, and Jennifer is going to, she's um, at the University of Toronto, great expert in this area of the law. Um, and she has uh, been awarded several research grants along with Grimman and Wilson, examining no fault compensation for vaccine related injuries, um, injuries. She's been working on this area for a long time and is closely following the developments in Canada where a new scheme was announced relatively recently and she's going to at a federal level and there is also the pre-existing uh, Quebecois uh, scheme. So I'm going to try um, and open up the on the screen. Jennifer, you can see it. You're very clear and helpful overview and I'll hand over to you. Okay, great. Well, thanks um, very much. I just wanted to take a quick moment to thank the organizers for the opportunity to talk about this newly formed Canadian uh, or pan-Canadian vaccine injury program. I've created this information sheet because I can't condense some of the more fine granular information in five minutes. So today I wanted to focus uh, primarily on why now? Why after uh, one of our provinces in Canada, the largest province, uh, the second largest province, Quebec, uh, implemented their program 33 years ago, why did uh, we take such a long wait and see before following suit? So I'd like to talk a little, focus my discussion on why, why 2020? Um, I'm going to just quickly go through a little bit of uh, detail on, on how the program works. Uh, and of course, it's proposed. We haven't, there's not been a single case adjudicated to my knowledge yet. Um, Jen, and, can you speak up a bit, Jen? Sorry, can you speak up a bit? The sound's not great. Could you, yeah, if you could just come a little bit closer to the mic and speak up, I think um, people, uh, thanks. Sure, is that better or is that? Uh, that's, be that's a bit better. Thank you. Okay. Um, so basically, I'd like to just uh, briefly focus on why now, um, what the what the application process is like from the view of a claimant, and then finally, because this is modeled after a program that's 33 years old, we've got lots of experience on the Quebec model. What do we anticipate some of the strengths of this approach and weaknesses will be? So the first question, of course, is why now? Um, there's been a, a long-standing consensus in the legal uh, literature and the ethics and, and uh, medical literature that we need a no-fault compensation approach to dealing with vaccine injuries. Um, there's a consensus that vaccine injuries are a unique kind of medical injury because of the benefits that are gleaned uh, to the public for people uh, participating in this risk. Uh, and that benefit should be rewarded by uh, this a duty to care uh, in, in the event of these uh, injuries. Uh, in, in terms of the legal climate across Canada uh, and in Quebec, there really hasn't been a single successful personal injury case related to vaccines, uh, despite several high profile cases. And indeed it was a high profile case in Quebec in the um, 19, uh, late 1970s, early, early 1980s that led to 
uh, the formation of a Quebec program. So it was a high profile failed vaccine injury case. Um, the parents failed to uh, receive any kind of compensation. Uh, and in response, the Quebec government, the provincial government created this program in 1988. Uh, so the same factors I think that drove the adoption of a program in Quebec were probably having a, an opposite effect uh, in creating a national program, creating a national program in a federalist system with 13 different healthcare systems, 13 different vaccine delivery systems and programs. It's quite complex. And in the absence of any threat of litigation or withdrawal of vaccine uh, supply, there just wasn't, I think, the impetus to create a national program. Uh, again, there was a 33 year period of wait and see. Um, and I think if I can reflect on, on my experience in talking to people, policymakers, um, public health specialists, there really was to speak to uh, Elora, uh, Eleonora's point, there was a, there's a, a, an abiding fear that doing something and creating these programs could actually undermine public confidence in immunization. So I think the, um, the overarching sense for the past 33 years has been uh, doing nothing was probably safer than venturing into the no, in creating a no-fault compensation program. So I think this lack of litigation pressure um, undermined uh, the multiple attempts to create a national program. So why did uh, we create one in 2020? The, the announcement was made in December and it's not an accident that in the same week that they announced the no-fault compensation program that would be uh, created, um, they were also discussing the fact that they were uh, blanket indemnifying vaccine manufacturers for the, the novel vaccines. In September, we were faced with a second wave of um, COVID. Uh, I think the abiding anxiety at that time that was influencing the development of policy was that now not acting and not having a compensation program was probably more risky than actually venturing into the policy arena and creating this vaccine program. And so suddenly the balance tipped and while they were, while the procurement minister was announcing that yes, yes, we've indemnified vaccine manufacturers, but, and we are assuming government, we're assuming liability, we are also uh, creating this new pan uh, Canadian injury program that is going to compensate people for uh, any serious uh, adverse events following um, uh, immunization. Okay, so I think I want to just now just shift quickly. So that's the why, why we uh, implemented the program. I think it's very clear that the Canadian program was modeled after what is perceived to be a very successful Quebec program that was created in 1988. Uh, the Quebec program uh, compensates and, and similarly the can, can the Pan-Canadian program will compensate for all licensed vaccines. In Quebec, there's a statutory um, list of vaccine preventable diseases and all of those um, vaccines that are licensed against those infectious diseases are covered under the program. Both programs are so focusing on um, serious adverse events. Um, there is the language of permanence, but uh, any um, life altering permanent or serious uh, adverse event is eligible. There is a uh, limitation of three years from onset of symptoms um, or the, uh, from the vaccine. So in terms of the eligibility criteria, it's actually quite uh, typical of what you would see in most uh, compensation programs across Europe um, and um, it's, I would say in terms of the kinds of proof needed or application process, and um, it's a fairly straightforward process. There's a web-based um, intake for the, the national program. Similarly, for the Quebec program, you can either access the forms that are required through the uh, internet or through government websites. Um, interestingly enough, in the uh, Pan-Canadian program, they are introducing um, a very quick screening process to see if your basic eligibility is met. 
The basic eligibility requirements uh, for the new program include vaccines that are uh, administered in Canada that are licensed um, and uh, that does not require citizenship uh, test or anything like that. Um, you have to prove that you, you actually have the, va the vaccine and you have to submit both a, a basic overview of your medical records or detailing um, your medical history. And then you have to uh, seek out a, um, a, a physician's assessment or report. And those reports have to be uh, created by licensed physicians. In Quebec, the physician has to be licensed in Quebec. And then in Canada, they simply have to be a licensed uh, Canadian licensed physician to make this report. But I think it's quite important when you contrast what's going on in this non-adversarial approach to the process of application to say countries like the United States where it's more adversarial, the emphasis is on using um, attending physicians or physicians that were directly involved in your care um, your primary care physician is, is often solicited to write the medical report because they presumably would know your, your case best. That, that's in stark contrast to other systems which invite the development of medical experts who then, um, without knowing the individual beforehand, uh, are solicited to provide expert opinion on whether or not a, a, a novel theory of harm is related to that particular vaccine. So really the emphasis is on having the care, the care practitioners directly involved in the patient's case, writing up a medical report, assessing the degree of disability, and putting a case forward that uh, talks about the, the degree of the disability and the likely causal relationship. In both systems, both the Quebec... Just and wrap up now, Jen, I'm afraid we've gone over the time a bit. If you want to just wrap up, please. Um, so I, I, I think that the... Like, like in all of the systems we have uh, that we've discussed and we are discussing today, I think that the core um, issue that, that confronts uh, both the Quebec system and the, the Canadian system in general is going to be what, if you require a medical report written by a healthcare practitioner that's directly related to your care, that already uh, invites certain barriers. Uh, people who don't actually have a primary care physician, I don't know if that's common in the UK system, but in Canada, there are whole provinces where having a, a, a personal uh, physician uh, assigned to you is actually not, not common. So there are barriers that have to be addressed. And I think that the, the um, administrative body that's overseeing the new system is aware of it. And they are trying to come up with mechanisms like applying a case manager for people who don't have a primary care physician to assist with the application process. Thanks very much, Jen. Thanks very much for that update. Um, we're gonna have to move on now to um, Australia. Marco, Dr. Marco Rizzi, um, who joins us from um, the University of Western Australia Law School as a senior lecturer. He's specialised in torts, health policy, risk regulation, published uh, a lot in this area. Um, and he's also a member of a, a research project, the UWA VaxPol Laboratory, which works on these topics. Thanks very much, uh, Mark. I think you've got some interesting recent news to tell us about as well. Thanks, Duncan. Um, yes, thank you for thank you for inviting me and for uh, core jointly organizing this uh, this meeting. Um, well, I think my role uh, until Friday was to just present the situation of a country that has absolutely nothing by way of uh, no fault compensation plans. Uh, that perhaps changed on Friday afternoon. Um, so let me just, you know, give you a little bit of context. So there is no, uh, there is nothing like a vaccine compensation scheme in, uh, in Australia. Uh, the arguments that I was hearing earlier from uh, Jennifer sounded extremely familiar, uh, and it also resonates a little bit with what Geraint was saying. Um, the government has often shut down any uh, attempt, uh, any proposal to establish uh, a fund of this sort on the basis that it would instill fear, right? So you say, why do we need a fund? Are you saying vaccines are dangerous? 
so that was, and, and, and that was a way of not even starting the conversation for quite some time. Um, now, what has happened on Friday? On Friday, 2nd July, uh, the Minister of Health uh, announced that um, Australia is going to adopt an indemnity scheme. That's what they call it, a COVID indemnity scheme, which has a twofold um, role. First, it protects health professionals who are administering the vaccines. But, and again, what Jen said about the relationship between the federal level and the state level resonates very much because this indemnity scheme will only protect health professionals who are administering the vaccine uh, under the auspices of the Commonwealth. States also have uh, some form of vaccine uh, rollout mechanism, but those GPs and uh, other uh, health professionals who are administering the vaccine in state premises won't be covered. So that's one little quirky aspect of this, uh, of this uh, scheme. Another interesting thing is that the second purpose of establishing this scheme is to say that in the event, and I'm quoting here, that someone suffers a significant adverse reaction causing injury and economic loss because of vaccination, the scheme will help guide potential claimants through a no-fault claims process scheme. The other part is that proven claims will be uh, able to receive appropriate compensations without the need to go through court processes, but this, this will not bar claimants from potentially um, pursuing an action to a court judgment if that is their preference. These two little paragraphs that I just quoted is all that is available for the moment. So we know nothing in terms of what the eligibility criteria will be, what types of causal uh, mechanism will be necessary to, uh, you know, what kind of causal hurdle uh, will have to be uh, passed by uh, claimants. So we don't know anything really. But what is the background of this decision, this sudden decision? The background is that the rollout in Australia is extremely slow. The rollout of COVID vaccine is extremely slow. Uh, Australia, the latest statistics is trailing OECD countries. Um, I think we are the OECD country with the lowest uh, percentage of fully vaccinated population. Uh, Part of this is because uh, the Australian government had completely relied on the AstraZeneca vaccine and then had to change its recommendation based on uh, our technical uh, expert advisory group. Uh, and now AstraZeneca is no longer recommended for anyone under 60 until, but, but, but because we're trailing so much and we have so much AstraZeneca vaccine as a, uh, compared to any other type of vaccine, the government said the, the prime minister invited anyone under 40 to talk to their GP and consider taking the AstraZeneca vaccine. Now, the problem is the entire argument about instilling fear no longer works, of course, because we know what the risk that is linked to the AstraZeneca vaccine. So in this changed circumstance, it's no longer about instilling fear, but confidence and therefore it becomes more politically expedient to propose a compensation fund. However, what this fund exactly will look like is still quite mysterious. Uh, the last thing I'm gonna say, and then my time is up, is that in the Coronavax project that um, is this big project that uh, I'm part of where we study attitudes of Western Australians towards the COVID vaccine rollout, we did ask questions about compensation scheme to gauge a, bit, a little bit the attitudes of the population. And the very interesting thing is that while I suspect that we would have like an overwhelming majority of participants uh, resoundingly agreeing, it's almost split. I would say it's a 60-40 with quite a, a significant large chunk of the population thinking, you know, um, uh, taking a fatalist approach or saying, we don't have this type of compensation for other types of injuries, so why should we have it for this one? Um, and so it's going to be an interesting task for the government, crafting both uh, the actual scheme and the messaging around it, because apparently it is, it, it's a divisive uh, topic. Um, that will be it. Thanks, Marco. Very interesting indeed, um, and particularly that empirical work you've been doing, informing the the overall debate. Um, Norman, 
Can I hand over to you? Uh, Norman Fitzleb is an Associate Professor at the Chinese University of Hong Kong, where he leads the Obligations Lab Asia, um, and he continues to be an adjunct Associate Professor at Monash University, specialising in torts, remedies and comparative law, so perfect for this area. Norman, hand over to you and I will at the same time open, hopefully, your PowerPoint. You are mute, Norman. I just realized. <laughs> okay, hello everyone from Hong Kong. Uh, thanks, Tang, for bringing us together tonight and for allowing me to speak. So I'll provide an overview of the, uh, the Hong Kong scheme in the next few minutes. So Hong Kong set up an indemnity scheme in February uh, 2021. It's the first vaccination uh, indemnity scheme. And it's intended to uh, provide support to eligible individuals who suffered a serious adverse event following immunization with a COVID-19 vaccine. That's why the fund is also called the AEFI fund. The fund has a size of a, up, to a, up to a billion Hong Kong dollars, which is about 108 uh, million euros and uh, covers COVID-19 vaccinations under the official vaccination program. And Hong Kong uses both the Sinovac vaccine and the BioNTech vaccines. In terms of the events covered, this, uh, the scheme uh, you know, basically covers serious adverse events uh, and you know, listed events in the, um, in the guidance are death, disability and hospitalization in association with vaccination, but also specific conditions such as uh, facial paralysis, uh, anaphylaxis and, and sepsis. An applicant under the scheme must satisfy a medical assessment panel that there was causality between the vaccination and the adverse event. And the threshold for establishing that is that uh, the association between the adverse event and the vaccination cannot be ruled out. Uh, following the causa uh, causality evaluation, uh, the uh, process moves on to an assessment of the severity uh, if a claim is accepted, an applicant can receive a lump sum compensation. The lump sum compensation differs depending on age and differs depending on whether the adverse event is death or injury. Uh, the amounts are on the slide, so it's roughly about 300,000 US dollars. Uh, and uh, the level depends on the severity of injury rather than on the cost of um, medical treatment or other economic losses. And the maximum figures are broadly in line with what's available under, let's say, for example, the workers' compensation legislation in Hong Kong. The scheme doesn't rule out access to uh, the courts. So uh, a person that's affected by a vaccine uh, can still sue uh, for damages in, uh, in a civil process. Uh, Hong Kong doesn't have product liability legislation, which means you would be dependent on establishing under the tort of negligence uh, that, uh, you know, basically this, you suffer the injury because of someone else's fault. There is no uh, double recovery. So if a claimant receives um, compensation in court after already having received funding uh, under the scheme, then uh, the funding received will be offset from the court's award. Uh, the scheme has only been around a few months, so the data that we have as of June is that there have been 74 applications, three including uh, or, uh, relating to a person's death and seven to alleged injury. The majority of those cases are yet to be determined. Uh, uh, 15 have been decided and uh, they were all injury cases and in three of those 15 cases payments have been made one for anaphylaxis, one for hospitalization, and one for Bell's palsy. The total amount is 450,000 for all three uh, people affected. The last slide uh, just shows the process of obtaining compensation again. As I said, it's a four-stage process. Uh, the first is that a medical practitioner must report and certify that there was a serious adverse event. Then uh, the process moves to an expert committee on clinical assessment. Uh, that engages in the causality assessment. The scheme administrator is a government-appointed uh, basic insurance company, AXA Hong Kong, 
and they uh, conduct the severity assessment and make a proposal for an appropriate payout. But the ultimate decision on payout and the payout itself is uh, undertaken by the government. Uh, and uh, yes, I think hopefully that's enough as a first overview. You know, so in Hong Kong, basically, as I said before, uh, you know, it's also new. You know, to have a vaccine compensation scheme, but it seems uh, you know fairly developed. You know, and is already operative at this point. Thanks, thanks, Norman. Um, so finally, last but not least, we have France. Jean Sebastian Bourgetti joined us uh, from uh, l'Université de Paris 2. Uh, Jean Sebastian, uh, do you want to say a word about the French scheme? Maybe it's like Jean Sebastian is, a, there were a couple of questions came up. Maybe, can you hear Jean Sebastian? We'll revert to some questions. Yes, I can hear you. Great, over to you. Do you want to say a quick word about the, the French scheme? Uh, yes. So very quickly, um, <clears throat> France is familiar with no food compensation schemes. We've got many of them. Um, we've got one, for example, for compulsory vaccinations, uh, but there's no compulsory vaccination against COVID so far in France. But uh, we also have a competence, compensation scheme for uh, medical accidents, and it has been decided that um, well, um, let's say damage caused in connection with health measures taken for the, the COVID crisis would be eligible uh, for the, well, at the medical, at the, well, medical accident compensation scheme. So basically, if you suffer a side effect after a COVID vaccination, uh, you are eligible for that no fault compensation scheme. It's actually not very well known in France. Uh, the, government the government hasn't put that forward in order to you know, foster vaccination against COVID. And as far as I know, we don't have any figures about how many people have applied uh, to that, for that scheme so far. But the conditions of eligibility are very broad since uh, the only thing you, you need to, to be eligible is to have suffered harm as a result of vaccination. So it can be any type of physical harm. There is no threshold. Um, the, 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 the law says that the, the harm must be attributable to uh, the vaccine, well, to, to the COVID-19 vaccination. So basically that means that it must be caused by the vaccination. And there is no uh, clear time limit uh, for, well, for, for the application. So you don't have to, to do that very quickly after having been vaccinated. Um, the, the procedure, the whole procedure is free of charge for the claimant, unless he chooses to, uh, to take a lawyer, in which case you must pay, of course, for that lawyer, but otherwise it's free of charge. What you need to do is just to send a formal request to the ONIAM, which is, a, which is basically the, um, the body in charge of running the medical accident, non well, no-fault compensation scheme in France. And once it has received the, the request, the ONIUM can decide to uh, make an expertise to, well, to assess the magnitude of damage and also possibly the existence of causation, but that's paid for by the ONIAM. So the, 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 the applicant doesn't have to pay anything for that. And the ONIAM has an obligation to give an answer within six months of the request. And if the ONIAM accepts the request, and so accepts that uh, damage was caused by the vaccination, uh, then it must make an offer to the claimant, which fully compensates the harm. The only thing is that uh, the ONIAM has its own uh, scales or compensation index, which some regard as too mean. So um, theoretically, the ONIAM should compensate fully any damage caused by vaccination, but in practice, some people might think that it's not enough. But if someone, uh, well, if the ONIAM rejects the compensation request, for example, because it thinks that there is no causation, or if the claimant finds that the offer is not satisfactory, then the ONIAM's decision can be challenged before a court, before an administrative court. Uh, <clears throat> besides, um, the, the fact that, well, you don't, need to, you don't need to go through that scheme. So you can also um, sue directly the producer, for example. So 
the, 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 the liability path is still open. And actually, even if you've bought, uh, even if you made a request under that scheme, that no fault compensation scheme, you can still um, bring a liability claim against the producer. The only thing is, of course, that you, you cannot be compensated twice. And finally, as far as the funding is concerned, well, the ONIAM is uh, funded mostly by, by the state and by social security. And as far as I know, uh, there is no specific funding uh, associated with the compensation of damage caused by COVID-19 uh, vaccination. So it means that any compensation paid under that no-fall compensation, compensation scheme will be basically financed by the state or the French social security. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Jean-Sébastien. We've had a few questions coming in before we go on to the cost-cutting analysis. Uh, we've got one, I think, which is diverted to COVAX. So I'll ask maybe Anne if she would deal with the, the questions about the nature of the, the programme protocol and the eligibility issues in relation. Can I hand over to you, Anne, to briefly answer that question? Okay, thank you very much. Uh, and I saw an additional question about funding of the program by industry, and I'll address perhaps that question as well. Uh, so the protocol, um, which you can find on the program's website, is basically the procedure uh, uh, for the submission of application and the assessment of applications and how payments will be made. It's, it's nothing else than a procedure. And it is not linked to national legislation as such. Uh, uh, this is a, a, an international scheme which is centrally managed uh, by an independent claims administrator and has been set up uh, uh, by COVAX. And uh, uh, it doesn't require as such buy-in from countries. Eligible individuals in the AMC eligible economies can apply directly for compensation under a program if they have suffered a serious adverse event, resulting in permanent impairment of deaths following the administration of a vaccine that's distributed through COVAX. So those are the requirements. Having said that, uh, uh, um, we have asked national governments to ensure that the release agreement that individuals sign at the end of the process is enforceable uh, 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 under national law. So that's the only uh, uh, link, if you want, with legislation in countries. We've also asked the AMC eligible economies to uh, 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 raise awareness about the program in the countries so that injured individuals know about it, and uh, also to provide certain training to registered healthcare professionals in terms of tracking doses, et cetera, so that we know whether an injury has resulted from a COVAX distributed vaccine or from a bilateral dose. Um, um, so um, that is in respect of the first question. The second question related to what was the relation of the protocol to European Union countries. It, it has no relation whatsoever. The program is specifically limited to injured individuals in the 92 lower and middle income countries that are covered by the program. And the reason for ha having limited the scope of the program to this is that we needed to focus our efforts on the most resource poor countries. It was considered that other countries should be able to uh, 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 compensate their, their, their nationals and also have sufficient resources to live up to their uh, indemnification obligations. Whereas that is of course a much bigger problem for the 92 lower and lower middle income countries. And, and it's, it's also, it should be borne in mind that the establishment of the COVAX no fault compensation program has paved the way for the supply of COVID-19 vaccines to these 92 countries. It was among the conditions imposed by manufacturers uh, who were concerned 
about uh, 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 the, the, the indemnification requirements. Uh, then uh, about in, there was a separate question about funding uh, uh, by industry uh, of the COVAX no fault compensation program. And while this was considered, uh, a decision was made taken against it, particularly in order to avoid any undue influence over the program or a perception of undue influence and to ensure that the program remains a truly independent program. And therefore the program is entirely funded out of this uh, 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 per dose levy on each vaccine that's distributed to through COVAX to the AMC eligible economies. And there was one other additional question to just come in about the COVAX program. Uh, Jonathan Crichton has asked, will you publicly share criteria and I presume data in relation to the eligibility, she says, injury, severity, permanence of injury, and the speed of the claims process and transparency benchmarks? Okay, so uh, 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 firstly, the, the entire, uh, uh, all the program documents are available uh, uh, on the web portal. And um, secondly, it is the intention for transparency purposes uh, uh, to, in the near future, to start publishing anonymized data on applications and claims on the program's web portal. So yes, that's the intention. Thank you very much, Anne. Um, there are a number of other questions. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna propose that we, we move the question to the discussion. We need to get on to now the discussion of the cross-cutting issues, but we'll revisit some really interesting questions about the severity of the injury eligibility, those sort of issues. And what we're trying to do is input that into the discussion right now. What I'm gonna do is we've got four sections now we wanna look at. What we're gonna do is ask, those chairing each, keep that to 10 minutes so we don't go over the time too much. Um, and we could try and deal with some of those questions that have come in during that discussion. So the, 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 the first issue that Sam Halubin is going to deal with is eligibility, Sam. Um, and I, I note that Dean Plater has said, can participants provide perspectives on the interpretation of criteria to determine permanency in their relevant respective schemes, which I think falls within that scope, Sam. So if I hand over to you, maybe you can include some of that in, in your, your thinking as to sort of you know, levels of injury, permanency, severity, et cetera. And if you can keep that up to 10 minutes, that'd be much obliged. Thanks, Sam. Yeah, absolutely. And Duncan, am I coming through clearly now? I, I feel That's like fine. there was this. Okay. We can't see you, but we can hear you. Fine. Yeah, I'm leaving the video off because I think it might help with the, the sound. Um, yeah, so, you know, eligibility, is, as Duncan mentioned in the, the questions in the Q&A mentioned, sort of involves sort of the, you know, the, the time in which the adverse reaction uh, emerges or manifests, um, sort of the level of injury that must be shown, for example, you know, 60% you know, disability in, in the UK. Um, so I'm going to sort of confine my opening comment to, again, the, the 14 new jurisdictions uh, that we studied. Um, so the 14 no-fault compensation systems that we've identified, again, a, a kind of mix of high-income countries and, and low or middle-income countries, about half of them require registration with um, I'm sorry, Duncan, you want me to share my video? No, that's no, no. I haven't. I haven't okay. I didn't do anything. I think we just there was just a glitch there, and we we missed your sound. But that's fine. You Got know. it. About half of which, uh, about half of those jurisdictions require national registration. Uh, that may seem obvious um, to uh, uh, to many in the audience, but in uh, in in many countries, um, the whole process of regulatory review is cumbersome or entirely non-existent. Um, so only about half of the countries require that a, an actual regulatory authority approve the vaccination. Um, uh, Tunisia's system only covers vaccines uh, and drugs with a marketing authorization, for example, um, but Peru's requires only that the vaccine be acquired by its Ministry uh, of Health. Um, Colombia's 
uh, regime uh, requires that it be adopted pursuant to an emergency approval or temporary special approval. Um, but then it explicitly refers um, liability back to default normal traditional rules um, after the expiration of those approvals. Um, the Philippines requires that the vaccine be administered through its official COVID-19 vaccination um, program. In terms of timelines, I already mentioned that Honduras is a law only allows 60 business days after vaccine administration um, at the low end. At the, at the more generous end, Singapore's law provides for three years from the date of the occurrence for an individual to submit an application, but that application must be verified by an attending medical physician. Um, as with sort of the administrative aspects um, of, of these new schemes, um, most of them don't specify timelines for claims. Um, one of the more specific uh, systems, Poland's, requires a 14-day stay in a hospital um, to be eligible for compensation. Nearly all of the new systems um, limit the compensation to the actual injured party. Um, so if you think about the way that sort of injuries may affect work in sort of uh, communities or, or villages, um, sort of we've only identified um, two uh, countries that explicitly allow relatives or dependents to make those claims on behalf of the um, injured party. Um, several countries tie uh, eligibility explicitly to regulatory criteria. Um, and Jen can speak a little bit more about this, but for example, Canada, Colombia, Guatemala, Honduras, and Peru uh, make those eligibility criteria for uh, serious adverse reactions, for example, very close to the articulation of what the World Health Organization um, uh, uh, identifies as being serious reactions. So that would be life-altering injury, in-person hospitalization, prolongation of existing hospitalization, or something that results in something like a congenital uh, malformation. Um, so I think ultimately the takeaway from eligibility for the new systems um, is that they have created even more diversity in terms of those thresholds. Um, but the World Health Organization's criteria um, have been broadly uh, guiding those, those determinations. Again, a lot uh, in the statutory schemes is left for further later regulatory or ministerial action. Duncan, I'm going to go ahead and uh, leave it there in the interest of time. Thanks very much, um, Sam. Daniel Lucy from McCann Fitzgerald in Ireland made an interesting point. He said, is the severity of, in of injury required in certain eligibility too strict in some cases? He says, if, you're, if it's got to be very severe, i.e. life altering or 60% disability in the UK, is there not a risk that less severe, but nonetheless, you know, quite significant events will go uncompensated because of the difficulties of bringing successfully a case through the courts for the reasons we've heard from from a number of people um, I don't know if there's any reactions to that the you know the, the, the worry that there will be um, a, a falling between two stools in a way rent significant but not severe injuries not being um, compensated anyone want to, to talk to that react to that? I mean, I'll uh, give a, an initial response. The answer to that is absolutely. Um, and that's as true under the United States Compensation Injury Compensation Program as it is for the newly developed systems. Um, it, you, know, you know, for example, requiring a 14-day hospital stay will certainly leave many people who suffer adverse reactions but don't have the requisite say un uncompensated, even if it creates a longer-term um, disability or difficulty. Thanks, uh, Marco. Yeah, no, I think that's a, a really good point, especially as we're, as we're seeing that um, a number of the adverse reaction, the severe adverse reaction that are being uh, registered, they, are, um, they don't necessarily lead to permanent, 60% uh, permanent disability or threshold that high. So I think that especially if you're going to create something that, that has to be fit for purpose, you need to be a bit more flexible on those eligibility criteria. From that perspective, that little something, that very tiny little bit of information that we have in Australia, I think what's interesting is that the adverse reaction causing injury and economic loss. Uh, so, you know, the, the fact that economic loss, for example, is contemplated is an interesting is an interesting aspect because, for example, if you it might lead to something where if you if you miss work for a couple of weeks, that might be part of the of the compensation. And I think that would be 
sensible in the context of the, these vaccines. Thanks, Mark. Absolutely, yeah, point taken. Um, okay, so if there aren't any further questions, maybe we can move over to causation and quantum. I mean, it's touched on some of the things we've been looking at anyway, but I think causation is such an important topic. We've got, we've got the great expert on hand, Richard Goldberg, who's going to chair this. Richard, can I hand over to you? Richard's a professor of law at Durham Law School, great expert in products, product liability, um, pharmaceutical law, including vaccines as well. And he has his tome on causation and risk in the law of tort, scientific evidence, and medicinal product liability. Can you boil that down, that 400 page tome to two minutes, Richard? Well, one of the th things that I, I want to talk about, whether it kind of the issues, I, whether it be through um, litigation as a potential avenue, which is not well, available on the facts, but is precluded. You. Do you want to maybe turn off your camera? That may help the sound quality. I don't know. Maybe there's a sort of, so, bit of a feedback loop. Is that? Is that okay? Can you hear me now? That's fine. That sounds much better, actually. Can you hear me now? Sorry about that. Um, the first thing that I wanted to look at was the kind of um, the, the requirement for establishing causation. I think that is 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 a very important one. We've seen in um, with the Covax. Uh, requirements under the protocol, most probable cause on a balance of probabilities. Um, and I think <clears throat> this is going to be a central issue, the, uh, um, <clears throat> the COVAX one, or whether it even be the Hong Kong one. I mean, I, I was particularly uh, sort of slightly taken by the Hong Kong requirement association um, with of an adverse event with a vaccine cannot be ruled out. Possibility of any causal link uh, an epidemiologist would be able to show. So I think one of the things that what we need to kind of look at here is what is actually meant by probable in terms of the requirements here should we be able to use um, statistical evidence, epidemiological evidence? I mean, you, you asked me about my researches in that particular area. M my inclination is that if epidemiological evidence is available, then it has to be looked at within the context of all of the evidence that exists, but that it should not be prejudiced by biologically plausible evidence. Should that be regarded as important? Should case reports be able to trump uh, epidemiology? I would say no. So the issue is, um, sorry? Nothing, no, keep going, please. Can you, can, you, can I keep going? Please. please. Yeah. You hear me? We can. Can you hear me? Yeah. So, so the issue of biologically plausible mechanisms in relationship to COVID, I think is an extremely important issue and case reports of adverse reactions. As yet, we've only talked about associations uh, with these particular conditions. But as the evidence kind of um, unfolds, we'll be able to have more epidemiological uh, evidence um, as to what the current state of affairs will be. So I think what actually that is going to mean is, is very important. And also the difficulty, I think, a crucial thing of establishing causation with people who are vulnerable. I mean, let's face it, the COVID vaccine certainly in the United Kingdom has primarily been given to vulnerable people um, with underlying conditions and the difficulty of being able to distinguish between the attribution 
the vaccine causing the adverse effect and the underlying condition, I would have thought is a very important point. Um, yeah. The other issue is how robust will be the decision-making processes which are available. Um, I'm wondering about the, the, the variability, for instance, between the Quebec system and the system that's going to be available on a national level. I think the review panel and the advice provided by Science and Advisory Committee with COVAX is going to be very important. And we have to know how scientifically based it is. Um, and then the other issue would be the quantum. Um, is it proportionate? The GDP per capita of AMC uh, eligible economy requirement times 12 times the, the harm factor. Um, is that proportionate? And as Geraint has, has said, compare it to the ex Grecia UK system, where I think we are going to be seen to be pretty impoverished in comparison. Or maybe we have to take into account the fact that we have um, more uh, uh, of protection for uh, of an underlying social security system than most other countries. Anything else that I need to add to that, Duncan? I don't think so. That's that fascinating, Richard. Raised lots of really important issues there. I don't think people wanted to come in on that. I mean, it is a key issue. I noted, by the way, Richard, the Norwegian scheme is yes. um, starting to pay out in relation, make awards in relation to thrombosis cases, where yeah. I think, you know, the, yeah. there, I suppose- That's causal, really interesting. And the causal aspect there is maybe less problematic because of the medical explanation, et cetera. But then we get into other areas where it's going to be much more problematic, like GBS, some of the, you know, the sort of the, the, the issues which have been difficult to deal with, um, a lot of case law, for example, in France, the, I know you've commented it on in, in relation to, you know, those sort of issues. Uh, so there's going to be a variety of challenges, isn't there? I think across the, you know, depending on what the pathology which is um, in question. Anyone else want to in, uh, uh, interact? Norman, about that? I don't know if you'll take you any take on the, the, the wording of the causation um test in in hong kong i don't want to put you on the spot i know you're not you know you just sort of getting on top of hong kong tort law yes i mean there um, is not much more information than than what i presented you know so it sounds like a, a you know basically a pretty lenient test you know so um uh, you know but we don't really have a lot of information on how it's actually indeed. administered i think uh, it's it's alex here i i would add that um just historically in clinical trials we've used this uh, methodology, the balance of probabilities. And so there is some track record whilst it remains subjective and there is no easy way through this question. There has been a history for over 20 years of clinical trials liability of, of navigating this topic uh, and getting, I think, a, a fair and balanced outcome for virtually kind of every, every claim that we've been through, I think, has come to the right outcome. So, you know, whilst it is probably more subjective than we'd like and less clean cut, uh, I think ultimately the outcome of, of some of that language still works uh, in the field as we apply it. So there is some hope. Thanks, Alex. That's interesting. Jen, um, the, Rich just made the point about there may be a bit of a differential between the national scheme in Canada and the one at the province level, Quebec. You got any thoughts about that? Do you think there's likely to be some sort of convergence there? And then we'll come to Anna. See, Anna's got her hand up as well. But yeah, hand over to you. Um, in terms of uh, causality, the, um, the balance of probability seems to be the approach, case by case, reasoned expert um, analysis. So it's it's messy, it's ugly. There are going to be a very few cases where it's open and shut, maybe with the AstraZeneca vaccine in terms of. Uh, the thrombosis, that might be something. Um, there's also the issue of something might be compensated now, but epidemiological evidence will preclude that in the future. And that's something that you have to be aware of and armed for, that people today might get compensated for things that they won't be when the science becomes more articulated and clear. So I think that's a really difficult, thorny issue with how causality assessment will evolve. Um, in terms of... Um, uh, I think you were asking whether or not there are differences in, in the causality assessment provincially and versus the, the Canada, Canada Pro 
program, I, I think the approach is the same. Um, whether or not the statutory description of a serious permanent injury uh, will stand, will stand uh, at the federal level and the way it's described in the, in the program outline, it does say permanent, but in practice in Quebec, uh, serious life-altering injuries are compensated. Uh, however, that does preclude people who would have a temporary um, serious uh, reaction that they return to some sort of normal status within a reasonable amount of time. And that raises the whole issue of who can bear those kinds of costs better. So people from low SES backgrounds, those a similar event is going to be much more life altering and catastrophic than um, somebody who could bear those costs. And I can't really comment on, on my understanding of both programs of how that's going to be balanced. Uh, Thanks, Jen. Anne, can I hand over to you? Okay, thank you very much. Uh, uh, on, on the most probable cause standard or based on balance of probability, uh, we modeled this around the Swedish compensation scheme. And basically what it means is that, you know, an injury mm. is more likely than not to have been caused by uh, uh, a vaccine or the administration of a vaccine. And it's clearly a lower standard than causality, but that's also, it is on purpose because we want to make it an easier process for individ injured individuals uh, uh, um, to receive compensation. And uh, uh, in assessing claims and taking into account this standard of most probable cause, uh, uh, the, the, the review panel and in applicable cases, the appeals panel are guided by a scientific advisory committee. The scientific advisory committee is tasked with uh, performing an ongoing review of the uh, 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 literature on COVID-19 vaccine safety and uh, um, to provide uh, uh, the review panel and the appeals panel with updated information on the safety profile of each of the vaccines that are distributed through the COVAX facility and to provide advice on which types of injuries that manifest after vaccination are likely to have been caused by the vaccine and what are the characteristics of those injuries. So, so that's insofar as the, as the COVAX Health Compensation Program the process is intended to work. Um, uh, on the, I also heard comments on the level of compensation, uh, uh, which we have tried to devise a system whereby uh, the level of compensation that is, is offered is in fact uh, uh, higher than what is uh, uh, provided by the few national uh, no fault compensation programs that exist in the AMC eligible economies. And we also tried to make it equitable across the countries in that it takes into account uh, uh, um, the, the, the income, the, the, the GDP of each of the countries. Perhaps uh, um, I'll stop here and ask on this last point, Rafael to make a few more comments. Rafael? Yes, Anne, thank you. Please, okay. Re re Briefly, if you will, because we need to move on in a second. Thanks, Rafael. Okay, re regarding the, the level of compensation that we have chosen for a program, we have elected to start with the uh, GDP, the most recent uh, published GDP by the World Bank for each particular country. So we think that this uh, is a start to achieve a level of, of, of parity uh, uh, around the AMC uh, world. Now we have uh, uh, further chosen to multiply that amount by an, uh, a factor of 12, which is, uh, I admit, an, an entirely uh, arbitrary factor. But uh, uh, we believe that with this uh, 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 factor, we are increasing the level of compensation substantially so that the ultimate payout is, is as Anne has said, uh, uh, generally above what exists in other compensation programs. 
Now, each uh, once you make this initial uh, 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 calculation of the GDP times 12, then what comes into effect is, is, uh, is an evaluation of the level of injury. Uh, as Anne said earlier, we have chosen to uh, compensate for all kinds of permanent injuries, not only the very severe ones. And then we have established a, a fixed table depending on the level of injury that will give what we call a harm factor that ultimately will determine the, the, the level that, that is the payout. So we, we, we start with the GDP, we use the 12 factor, and then we apply a harm factor. And that's how we come with the ultimate amount. Thanks very much, Raphael. Move on now to the next section, which is process. We've got Professor Samuel Dehan um, in from Queen's Law, Canada, and Cornell, but sitting, I think, in, in the south of France. Nice place to be. Hi, everyone. Okay, so I'd like to talk a little bit about process, uh, but in order to think about, so I'm not an expert in product liability, so my area is um, data analytics and dispute resolution, and mostly related to online dispute resolution. So over the last few months, uh, we've been working with Duncan, uh, Class, and Samantha on what is the best process that should be designed uh, to boost uh, vaccine uptake and also to alleviate vaccine hesitancy. So, so the idea, so first, before thinking about what is the best process, whether compensation schemes are a good process, we try to think about the problem. And, and I think the problem here is it's not too bold to say that uh, the objectives and, and the problem with vaccine programs is to achieve herd immunity. So, but there's one, uh, there's one problem with vaccine hesitancy is that uh, uh, one pro problem with herd immunity is that there is evidence showing that a lot of people are more and more hesitant with vaccines. So, I mean, almost 40 million people on Facebook and Instagram are following anti-vaccine groups, and there's a lot of more evidence. There's a lot more evidence that that are uh, supporting this this claim. So, so now the question is, with that in mind, I mean, the question is whether schemes, compensation schemes, constitute an appropriate solution. So I'd say some, to some extent, uh, from a legal standpoint, definitely yes, uh, provided that these schemes are easy to use, which is not a, a easy, I mean, which is not so clear. And, but I think, and it, it is an incomplete solution. So I think there is a moral and legal uh, argument and legal imperative to be proactive in the development of a, of a remedy system like the COVAX and like many others. And, and I think they're very, they are important programs from a legal standpoint. And, and we definitely have to be proactive in the development of a, a remedy system, especially for those who experience side effects uh, when they're accepting the vaccines for the benefit of society. And they've been taking the risk to take the vaccine, uh, basically, as a whole, as a group, we should be looking after that. So, however, I don't really think uh, it will make, I mean, compensation schemes in general will make people less scared of the vaccine. I mean, no matter, no matter what, it, what is the source of the fear. I mean, sometimes it's the fear is driven by misinformation and sometimes actually driven by legitimate fears. I mean, for instance, in France, I mean, nobody wants to take AstraZeneca for a legitimate reason because people don't want to get blood clots. So, so I think it's time, I mean, it, there are ways to, I mean, we're trying to explore different versions of the schemes. So one that is more accessible, I mean, there are many ways to make uh, composition schemes more accessible through online dispute resolutions. I mean, and there's nothing new here. These are innovations that came, that were produced in the, in the 90s. And, and I think another aspect of improvement is to make a composition, I mean, a, a vaccine injury program that is less focused on what less focused on compensation, or at least not only focused on compensation. So in collaboration with Bickel and I should say in Paris and, 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 and some of my colleagues at Cornell and at Queens, uh, the Conflict Analytics Lab, we've designed a, a prototype of a pilot, um, a prototype AI system for vaccine injury program. So, 
Pisces. Hmm. Okay, so I mean, the idea here, I mean, is to. I mean, I can show you a little video that will summarize well. I don't know if you can hear this. Uh, uh, Duncan, can, is the sound working? Sounds not working. Just talk through it, maybe. Daniel. Okay. Okay. So, I mean, the idea is here to um, is to develop a system that will perform uh, several tasks. So, I mean, similarly to the to the uh, vaccine. Um, injury program, I mean, to the yellow card, um, it's okay, I mean, um, so similarly to the yellow card system, um, the main idea is to uh, have a self-reporting system. Secondly, I mean, we're trying to think about a new natural language processing system that will help to assess whether fears are driven by misinformation campaign or whether they're driven by legitimate fears. Then if, um, then third step would be to help the users to assess whether a vaccine, a side effect or symptom is actually a side effect and whether it's a lifelong, it's a lifelong problem or, or actually it's caused death or it's more likely that it's been caused by the vaccine that it was not. And if it is, we would do uh, something that would be probably a little bit unusual in this area, we would match the user, the idea is to test matching the user with a trained mediator that would assist the user to um, submit a complaint both to the Canadian and the American system. That would be the pilot, uh, uh, um, that would be the pilot technology. And then if, however, even if the claim is not eligible, if the model, I mean, the AI, AI system identified that the claim is ineligible, but is driven mainly by misinformation. And it's mainly driven by some kind of a uh, concerned um, a, a misinformation campaign. The idea is also to match this, this user with a mediator to assist them. So here we're trying to combine a automation system. I mean, it's not really an automation, it's assisted dispute. That's what we call in the jargon of ODR, assisted dispute resolution system with a human dimension. I think the psychological, the human dimension, the human support uh, with a vaccine uh, uh, injury dispute resolution that in my opinion is missing with the current system, which is very much focused on compensation. Even though compensation is extremely important from a legal perspective, I think there's many other ways to improve, uh, uh, to develop a uh, response to uh, uh, vaccine injury issues. So now the question is whether this is going to work or not. I mean, that's the whole essence of this research. So we're trying to, we will try different tools, develop this pilot system, which will operate mostly as a broker, as a middleman between patients and vaccine injury programs. And also test new ways to uh, assess causation between symptoms and side effects, as well as tracking misinformation, which is not a solved problem in AI. Um, and eventually we'll see whether this boost uh, vaccine uptakes, or maybe this will just have no effect, or maybe people just care about getting just a, simply a compensation. I think that's pretty much it, Duncan. I mean, I'm happy to do Thank you. Thanks, Samuel, for that. Um, excellent. Listen, we're running out of time, so I do want to deal with the last point, which is a systemic issue, which Marco Rizzi is going to going to um, pick up. Uh, and I know it's come up quite a lot in some of the questions as well about the relationship between uh, the schemes and potential for litigation. We talked, we, we heard about the question from Daniel Lucy earlier on about the difficulties of bringing claims under the ordinary product liability um, sphere. We've got a question also from, I'll just flag up from Peter Todd in relation to the UK questioning whether some of the immunities um, provided for the UK in relation to the emergency, whether that is incompatible with 
the um, human rights protections, Article 6 and Article 8 of the ECHR. Hand over to you, Marco. Thanks for that, Duncan. Um, so uh, before I try to, um, you know, discuss a little bit the, the, those those questions, um, uh, my my view of the the systemic issue is kind of triangular in a way. So I think the the, the top the most important thing is um, is funding because. Uh, if you establish a compensation scheme, the money has to come from somewhere, right? So the point is you're gonna give a, a modicum of compensation, which is never gonna be as much as you would get in litigation, but a point or, you know, uh, a best approximation of that. But the point is uh, you, you want to compensate, that's what it's called. So you need to source the funding. And um, by and large, I think you, you can have the, the, the schemes that um, the possibilities seem to me to boil down to three broad options. One is government funded, just taxpayers, taxpayer money. That is, um, I believe the Italian scheme is mostly tax, uh, taxpayer uh, money. You can have a different, a different approach, which is um, a levy on manufacturers, basically. So manufacturers chip in to a fund, which will then, uh, in case of injuries, compensate, you know, go towards the compensation. Or you can have a hybrid in which uh, manufacturers and governments uh, in different proportions uh, chip in. Um, and uh, this issue of funding and the way in which you design the funding ties into uh, a, a different topic which kind of uh, emerged a little bit in, in, the in, the, in the national presentations. So when we were, I, I suppose uh, what Geraint was saying was interesting from that perspective. So what is the purpose of these schemes? Is it to compensate? So is it to create a safety net? Are we trying to create a safety net for people who are injured and suffer from uh, you know, a severe adverse event? Or are we trying to create a shield uh, for, for companies? And I was quite interested in, in, uh, in what Geraint was saying, because it sounds to me that the UK system is more of a shield and to, to, to the point that it even, you know, somehow it, it's, it's like something that companies can have as a form of protection from, from, from claims. Uh, and I think Eleonora was making a similar comment um, that you often see that an impact, like a, a sort of side collateral effect of, 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 a, of, a, of a scheme is that it, de facto shields from liability because you have the sort of uh, easier way which in which, which you want in a way because what you if you where you want to achieve is compensation but it does create an issue of accountability potentially uh, of uh, of companies and um, so so there's this issue of are we trying to create more of a safety net or more of a shield and finally, that ties into the relationship with the, with the liability scheme. So um, are we um, allowing people who go through the compensation scheme to still be able to sue in whether it's negligence or product liability or not? And I think one, one aspect that is interesting here is uh, that it's not necessarily up to the compensation scheme to make that decision. Because if you think about uh, what is happening with COVID vaccine, my, most countries, I believe most of the European countries, certainly Australia, have explicitly shielded companies from liabilities. So uh, I find it ironic that our, uh, you know, the Minister for Health in Australia is saying, you know, uh, injured parties can go through the, the no-fault compensation scheme, but they can still sue. I'm not exactly sure 
who they're going to sue because they can't sue the manufacturers since they've been explicitly shielded from liability. They could try and sue the health professionals in negligence, but I mean, that's a little bit of a, of a long shot. So I think there's this threefold dimension. And I think if, uh, there, there comes a point in which really becomes a normative decision what type of orientation you, 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 you take. And I think in the context in which we are, and I'm gonna, and I'm gonna end here, I think it definitely makes sense to look at this type of scheme as, as, as a safety net. Uh, so where the priority is compensation for people who, who suffer adverse effect, which will have a, an impact on, on funding. Uh, I'm not entirely sure what the best solution is, but probably perhaps a mix in a situation in which most companies have been, have been uh, shielded from liability. And um, yeah, I'm going to leave it there because I think um, Thanks, this is Mark. a very complex topic. Certainly is. It's a very interesting one. I think maybe Eleonora can, can resolve it for us in an elegant final statement. I hope to be elegant. Thank you, Duncan. <laughs> I, I try to be brief. Uh, I totally agree with the picture designed by Mark Rue, who who show shows us also the different aims that we are looking at. For sure, as it appears in all the inter intervention, there's a need, social need for a compensation scheme, which makes easy and um, free of charge uh, the possibility to have an indemnity for the victim of the side effects of the vaccines. However, looking very quickly to the effect on the system. This is exactly what Marco was saying. It's a shield which protects the producers from liability. It's true that with the COVID, um, with the vaccine against COVID, the, the producer is already protected either by law as it is in the US or by contract as it is in Europe. However, we cannot uh, ignore this effect. And I think that we as legal scholars, we should put in our analysis uh, this kind of problems and, and of concerns, because at the end of the day, what we do have this phenomenon, which is clearly analyzed by eminent economists such as Joseph Stiglitz. Uh, on one side, the privatization of the profits, all the profits, and here we are talking about profits which are not the result of a competitive market, but profits profit which, which are the result of a patent law. And on the other side, we have the fully socialization of risk. All the cost is on the public. That's why I was very surprised when uh, Anderlein told us that COVAX uh, uh, setting up the compensation fund didn't decide it not to involve the producer, not to ask him a co contribution to the financing of the, of the fund. Because for me, this is a maybe a way, one of the solutions we can discuss in order to rebalance a system which is clearly unbalanced. This uh, split between uh, privatization of profit and socialization of risk is uh, explained as the main cause of the social inequalities which characterize our societies by economists. That's, I think, that's why I think we should implement this problem in our analysis. Thank you, Duncan. Thanks, Eleonora. Well, we've almost run out of time. I don't know if people want to react to that. Anne, Anne Len, please react uh, to Many thanks. As I mentioned, the reason why we didn't want the program to be funded by industry is that we wanted to ensure absolute independence of the program. And we didn't want uh, 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 any undue influence on the program, nor did we want to create any perception of a conflict of interest. And that would have considerably diminished public trust in the program, and which is exactly what we wanted to avoid. We wanted to create a very high level of trust across these 92 countries or individuals in these 92 countries in the program and a very high level of trust in the fact that they would be administered independently and uh, uh, completely separate from industry or from other stakeholders. 
And that was the main reason why uh, no contributions were sought from manufacturers. Also bear in mind, the uh, COVAX No Fault Compensation Program is not a long-term compensation program. It is a time-limited arrangement to deal with the acute phase of the pandemic and so as to ensure that the most resource-constrained countries get access to COVID-19 vaccines and that those who have access will have a high level of trust in what happens. And that was the main driver in everything that we did. So I just wanted to put it in that perspective uh, uh, and why we made certain decisions. Thank you. Also, also to add, uh, Duncan, if I may, that although the manufacturers are not contributing, we are not transferring the costs to the general public, to the governments, because the, uh, it is, the funding comes from donors. It does not come from the governments. Uh, for the tax system. So I think, I think we accomplished both uh, uh, objectives of, of, of uh, maintaining uh, 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 out, uh, the program outside of any form of conflict and not charging the general public for it. Thanks very much. Um, Marco, please. Let's see about just please. Oh, yeah, no, I was just... Um... It's, it's interesting that um, we, we're used to think of philanthropic capitalism as, uh, you know, the driver behind uh, things like vaccine uh, development and discovery. Uh, and many have expressed uh, some, some doubts as to the, you know, whether this is really a good thing. And I, I think what Eleonora was saying really resonates with me because I, I believe that it's not, the, the one, to say that the cost is not transferred on the general public is one half of the story. The other half of the story is uh, the privatization of profits. And I, and, and I, I agree with that. I think it, it is, there is a risk in which we basically are creating a system in which the, the, the accountability, the, you know, the, the, the moment in which at, there comes a point in which accountability uh, happens, is is um, it's becoming a little bit less clear when this happens, and and so it's interesting that we're now creating a system in which philanthropic capitalism is at the front end and at the back end. Um, so we're basically relying on billionaires. I mean, yeah, it's a, <laughs> sorry, this was a bit. It, I was ending on a joke, but I think I think systemically, when we think about these things as as legal scholars, it, it, these are critical yeah. issues that we need to consider. Good point, Marco. And of course, the after H1N1 saga, uh, the Council of Europe, the European Parliament made very similar points. <laughs> Those made by Eleonora. And it's not just like Glitz and others. I mean, the, there are formal reports of the Council of Europe saying that after H and H1N1, we needed to review the situation because of the imbalance in terms of costings and liabilities as well as, as you say, deterrence, accountability mechanisms you're referring to, Marco. Uh, and they said, because next time that situation may be much more severe. So, you know, history repeating itself. And I think only by standing back and looking at the patterns, it's always difficult to deal with these in the heat of the moment, right? But standing back and look at them and trying to, you know, draw those lessons historically and draw those lessons also across the globe as well. That's what we've been doing today, is looking at the, looking at the schemes, looking at the way they're functioning, et cetera. And I think the COVAX scheme is very helpful in that in terms of you know, setting a real benchmark for, for other schemes. I mean, we can actually do that and um, learn from those lessons. So I think today has been really valuable to, for, for that purpose. And I, I thank you all for the time you've devoted to this. I hope we can continue in one way or another this discussion. It's not a discussion which is going to disappear. Um, and I think the final point is that, of course, uh, the there are you know individual stories behind this as well. Uh, quite difficult circumstances people find themselves in. Um, in um, and so 
behind these schemes, of course, the, is, is the desire to try and rectify and assist those persons and their families. And so that's, you know, behind what we're trying to do is facilitate that. So again, thank you to you all for the time devoted. We only shot by 10 minutes, but I think given the topics we covered, the complexity of topics we've done very well, thanks to you all um, for, for participating with information. Um, a copy of this or a, a, a version of this will be available on our website and hopefully we'll be able to follow up one way or another these discussions. So have a good afternoon, morning, evening, where you are.